Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's program, a conversation with New Hampshire Governor Maggie Hassan. Moderating that conversation will be Professor Charlie Whelan of the Rockefeller Center. State governors in the United States have challenging jobs, and each of them will tell you that one of their biggest challenges is jobs. When economic growth in the state is healthy, more people move into the labor force, and the financial burden to support public services is lower. Some governors are lucky enough to serve during a business cycle upswing, where economic momentum makes them look like they have the Midas touch. Others serve during business cycle downswings, in which factors beyond their control reduce the tax base and increase the financial burden on the public sector. A weak global, national, or regional economy is quite an albatross around the governor's neck as she tries to mightily to hold everything together. Perhaps the best you can hope for, other than a sympathetic citizenry, is to put in place good policies today that generate outcomes in the future, particularly so that future downturns can be less painful than they otherwise would be. We can see this hope in the work of Gov Governor Hassan since her election, with her Innovate New Hampshire Jobs Plan, her efforts to make public colleges and universities more affordable, and her support for research and development. Time will tell whether these policies will work out. We are pleased to be able to host this conversation about the framework that underlies these policies, Governor Hassan's vision for the state over the next decade, what we can do to prepare for demographic shifts that are already underway, and other issues of critical importance for New Hampshire's development. Now in her second term, Governor Hassan was first elected to the New Hampshire Senate in 2004. Over, the la over her six years there, she began her work to improve education, economics, and the environment in the Granite State. Her leadership skills were recognized by her peers, who selected her to serve as both President Pro Tem of, and Majority Leader of the State Senate. Her career in public service followed years as a business attorney, a law degree from Northeastern, and an undergraduate degree from Brown. Governor Hassan will be joined on stage this afternoon by Charlie Whelan who is a senior lecturer and policy fellow at the Rockefeller Center. Professor Whelan is popular to the point of a cult following on campus. <laughs> much, of it has to, <laughs> much of it has to do with his knack for distilling complex academic and policy issues into prose that is clear, concise, and even witty. His first book, Naked Economics, Undressing the Dismal Science, was widely praised and has now been published in 10 languages. He followed it with a sequel, Naked Statistics, Stripping the Dread from the Data. He is also known for his efforts to rebuild the center of the political spectrum, both as the author of The Centrist Manifesto and as a co-founder of The Centrist Party. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Charlie Whelan and Governor Maggie Hassan. Thank you for coming. Why don't we start very broadly without repeating your whole State of the State address <laughs> and just talk about from where you're sitting, not literally, but at yeah. the helm of the state, what you see as the great advantages and things going well for New Hampshire and what you think are our unique challenges. Well, I, I start every day uh, and everything I do thinking about really four basic goals in mind. How do we expand middle class opportunity in the Granite State? How do we help our businesses create jobs? Uh, how do we make sure that we are encouraging innovation at a time when we are seeing this huge transformation in um, our daily lives and in our businesses and our economy with the digital revolution? You know, we've integrated digital technology into our lives and businesses. Now we're really trying to leverage it. Um, and so uh, that, and then how do we retain and, well, attract and retain young people to the Granite State. Uh, one of our big challenges is that uh, we have more young people leaving uh, to go to higher education elsewhere than the average state does. And those four things really frame uh, the priorities that I think we need to uh, be addressing in order to keep moving the economy forward in New Hampshire. Uh, at this point in time, what I am most focused on is the budget, because as is true in anybody's uh, family life, business, or in government, uh, how you budget is really how you address your priorities. It really reflects how you address your priorities. And so right now, uh, I focus a lot on 
uh, those budget priorities that we uh, work to include in a very frugal budget that it reflects the values of the Granite State, no sales or income tax on the other hand, but trying to make sure that we are investing not only in a low tax environment, which is very important to our businesses and our families, but also uh, that we address their concerns about access to affordable higher education, um, excellent K through 12 uh, education and focus now on even earlier education than that. How do we make sure there are safe communities, modern and safe transportation infrastructure? All of those pieces of the opportunity infrastructure, if you will, that will help us not only move forward, but create jobs, grow and thrive as a people. So I want to follow up on two points that you made and kind of bring them together. One is the budget that New yeah. Hampshire is a relatively low tax state, no state income tax, sales tax. And the other is this need for what we would describe in these buildings as human capital, right. that for equipping people that no longer are the only way you really are right. going to create prosperity is from birth all the way up through right. higher exactly. education. So how can we reconcile those two things, that we've got less money to play with and particularly less money to move around? I mean, one of the things that distinguishes New Hampshire is that the difference between, say, a Hanover and a Mascoma, not very far away, right. but very different educational opportunities. So how do you provide what we know is fundamental, this, this educational opportunity, literally from birth all the way through, in an, an environment where there's not as much money as there would be in other states? Well, I, I think one of the interesting things is to step back a little bit from the assumptions behind that question. While we may not spend as much as other states, and we are uh, about fourth lowest per capita uh, st state spending uh, of, of any state in the country, uh, we are the seventh uh, best business tax environment according to the Tax Foundation. Um, but having said that, we have a 3.8% unemployment rate as of today. We're down another tenth of a point. Uh, we have um, wonderful quality businesses and very strong sectors in manufacturing, in travel and tourism. And we have schools um, in both uh, areas that one might consider wealthy and areas that one might consider economically challenged that are really doing wonderful jobs educating their kids. You can go all the way up to Milan, New Hampshire, where um, a school system that had at least some schools in need of improvement are now blue ribbon schools not because they spent a whole lot more money. You can go to Pittsfield, New Hampshire, uh, which has its economic challenges and not a whole lot of tax base, and find that with the help of a foundation grant from the Nellie Mae Foundation, they are focused on competency-based education in which New Hampshire is leading across uh, school districts and across uh, economic sectors. We have become national leaders. So I think one of the th advantages of the Granite State is, in fact, the human capital that you uh, talked about. It is, in fact, the thing I hear most about from businesses. When I say to businesses, what do I need to be prioritizing? They will say, uh, workforce, workforce, workforce. They need a strong workforce, so well-trained, healthy, um, able in all of the STEM skills, but also in the capacity to think creatively and to communicate. Um, and they need to know that they've got um, an environment that attracts uh, the kind of workforce they want to either stay here or to come here. So they've been focused, when, when I talk to them, they say, you know, invest in education, invest in infrastructure, um, invest in safe communities, uh, and uh, make sure that all our people have access to education and healthcare. And so um, that's really how you do it. And in New Hampshire, in part because uh, we don't have um, a lot of money, uh, we tend to focus on how we can do things uh, creatively and how we can be as responsive and nimble as possible to state government. So when, to drill down on the... Um, okay, did my mic go off? Up, uh, better? No. All right. Look at that. Yep. Very responsive. <laughs> the, uh, so to drill down on the employer piece, because this is not just a New Hampshire issue. Right. Around the, uh, the country and around yeah. the world, you hear employers saying, I need critical thinking skills, I need right. writing, and so right. on. So can you drill down specifically on things... <laughs> oh, okay. well, only, apparently only one works at, at a time. time. So uh, can we... No, more volume. More volume? Well, our, my, the mic keeps going off, but yeah. uh, in the absence of that. So one of the things that we hear around the world, certainly around the country, is this mismatch between the skills that graduates have and what employers want. Right. So can you talk specifically about things like specific programs, specific connections between yep. um, education and workforce? that help narrow that divide. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start, and volume good right now? OK. So l let's start with some basics and then move from there. 
Um, first of all, you have to have a higher education system um, that is uh, responsive and accessible and affordable. And that means you have to have a variety of levels, uh, but you also have to have funding for it. So one of the things that is at issue in the budget uh, that is currently before the legislature is that uh, I propose funding that would allow our university system to continue with a focus on uh, freezing tuition as they did in the last two years for the first time in 25 years. Our community college system reduced tuition and uh, if the funding that I put into my budget is supported, the community college can continue to reduce tuition uh, and the university system can keep its tuition uh, pretty close to where it is now, uh, if not freeze it. Um, the House took out all of my additional funding and actually brought the university system uh, back to funding that would be less than it's getting this current fiscal year. So you start with needing to make the commitment that will allow tuition to stay at a rate that not only young people, but people who might be mid-career and want to come back to the community college system for some level of job training, uh, you have to make it accessible. So that's number one. And that's one of the reasons that I've been focusing on this in the budget um, and been trying to work with the Senate and suggesting that we need to find a different path forward uh, for a final budget uh, that we can all support together. Um, then you want to make sure that your education system, not just your higher education system, uh, is really responsive to 21st century workforce needs. So I'll start by uh, talking about a couple of specific programs at higher education and then talk a little bit about um, the K through 12 uh, efforts we have in New Hampshire. So in higher education, uh, we have a university system that has committed itself to increasing the number of STEM graduates and increasing the number of New Hampshire-based STEM graduates. And that's a program that's ongoing. It is challenged a little bit by uh, the need for capital improvements to make that happen and a capital budget uh, that we haven't been able to fully support to get there. But they're doing some other things creatively to address that challenge. At the community college system, we have uh, come up with partnerships between specific employers and our community colleges. An example is the Albany Safran International effort in Rochester. Uh, that is a company that is making a whole new kind of aerospace components uh, right here in New Hampshire. It has led to us being a real <coughs> focus of the whole aerospace component industry, and we are becoming a major player in that sector because Albany International was able to come to our community college system and say, we're going to need 400 employees who know how to do a technology that nobody's ever learned before. And we established a campus right close to Albany International in Rochester. We are training up people. And we're using that experience as a pilot to be able to do it. A uh, Nashua Community College has some similar efforts going on. Um, the other thing we want to do is make sure that we are adjusting our curriculum at the community college level to the needs that our business, our, our business folks tell us they have. And so we're trying to make sure that we are aligning the curricular offerings at the community college level in particular with those needs. We're also trying to make sure that our university system and our community college system work together so that in certain uh, subject areas, certain career areas. We now uh, have a matriculation system so that students can start at community college. If they keep up, I think it's a 2.5 grade point average. Uh, they can automatically go to the University of New Hampshire for their last two years and get their bachelor's. Uh, it's a much more affordable package, uh, but it gets people to where they need to go. Um, in the K through 12 space, what we know is one, we need to do a better job of preparing our young people in the STEM space. And that's, as you point out, everybody's concerned about that. We, I put together a STEM task force last year. That STEM task force came up with uh, a number of recommendations. Uh, it was it consisted of business people, educators, teachers, um, a lot of different voices at the table. Uh, we are focused on how do we empower teachers and inspire students and implement recommendations at every level of education for more competency-based and project-based learning in STEM. But we also asked uh, that task force to look at how we uh, make sure that we are encouraging the arts so that STEM can be applied creatively, which I hear from business leaders all the time is really critical 
in this economy, um, and then how uh, we can make sure we're including uh, students of all backgrounds, uh, all demographics in this effort. Um, lastly, there's, you know, in incredibly compelling research that early childhood education is important not only for preparing a workforce but for uh, reducing other kinds of costs, uh, uh, you know, like the cost of incarcerating people, the cost of addiction, um, and uh, what we are working on in New Hampshire um, is making sure uh, that we are uh, our, our elementary educators are reaching out to private uh, daycare providers and doing the kind of best practice training that will make sure that students arrive in our public schools um, as prepared as possible. Um, the last thing I'll point out is that on a school, uh, Department of Education and school district basis, um, New Hampshire has become a leader in competency-based education uh, with some great pilots going on and we were the first state in the country to get waivers from the feds uh, to the Common Core testing, uh, the standardized testing. We're developing in four districts a new kind of daily assessment with project-based learning so that over time those students will take fewer and fewer standardized tests and will really be able to do the kind of day-to-day -day assessment that every good teacher really wants to have at his or her disposal. Is there any movement towards the uh, zero to four, space zero to five age? statewide investments either targeted towards low-income families? We, one of the things I put in my budget, which so far um, I think it hasn't survived, but it may come back in, is one um, it, it, a small investment in a study at how we might implement full-day kindergarten, uh, because that's obviously critical. And then um, we are trying to look at that zero to four space uh, with efforts by some of our um, our education advocates, especially looking for grant money that could help us do some critical work there. So you mentioned the House. Politicians yeah. are less popular than this plant, for the most part, uh, with no due respect, disrespect to the plant. Uh, could you talk just about the fractious political environment, not just in New Hampshire, but elsewhere? I mean, yeah. It certainly strikes me that we've reached a place where people are very disenchanted with the political decision-making process in general. Can you talk about the changes you've seen over your career and how it affects yeah. what you're trying to do? Um, I actually wish more people could come to Concord and see the day-to-day -day work that legislators do with each other, uh, with the public, and uh, with the executive branch. While there are clearly um, differences and there are clearly um, outliers, uh, there are a lot of people who, despite their differences, work very constructively together in Concord. That was certainly my experience in the State Senate. It has certainly been my experience um, as governor. One of the things I focus on is the fact that we are supposed to have disagreements in a democracy. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, and the whole vision that our founders had was that if we had more and more people at the decision-making table, uh, if we included more people with every, gen in, with every generation of Americans, um, that we would grow in our capacity to self-govern, not because we didn't disagree, but because we had all of the various perspectives we needed at the table. And then, despite our disagreements, we would come together because we understand that our job is to solve problems. It's not whether you argue. It's what you do after you argue that matters. So what we've worked really hard on in the last couple of years is having those disagreements understanding we're going to have them, but then at the end of the day coming together as we did two years ago with our bipartisan budget, um, most bipartisan budget in over a decade, a Republican Senate voted for it 24 to nothing, a Democratic House of 400, uh, there were only 14 no votes on the budget. Uh, we came together, um, I think everybody would say there was one or two things in that budget maybe they didn't like or they wish there had been a different approach with, but the fact of the matter is it's a budget that moved our state forward in really critical areas. We settled lawsuits, uh, we invested uh, in higher education, we invested in transportation infrastructure, we invested in all of the things that we know we need to do to provide the kind of uh, workforce and high quality of life that will drive our economy forward. And we did that despite disagreements. So one of the things I focus on right now is that uh, the House made significant cuts to our budget, um, cuts that will really pull the state backwards and really undermine the building blocks we, we put in place over the last two years. Um, I, I think one of the reasons they got there is that they were 
catering um, to the far right of their party. Um, so what I've really encouraged the Senate to do is to think about collaborating and compromising with Democrats as they form their budget so that we can get to a budget that will address the priorities that the people of New Hampshire tell so us I they care about. I think this is a really good point that the, the disagreement is an important part yeah. of the process. Certainly the Constitutional Convention was all about that. But certainly at the federal level, disagreement has kind of bled into paralysis. So, and governors, my understanding is it kind of rains down on you. And the so could you talk a little bit about from your perspective what the federal system looks like and if, if there's anything that could be learned from what you've been through that could help deal with some of those, because inaction is not disagreement. Inaction can be quite dangerous. Yeah, I, um, it, it is clearly, it is very frustrating uh, to be uh, sitting in my seat where I know uh, that the people of my state, whether in their businesses, in their families, in their communities, are solving problems every day. And the least they should expect from their elected uh, representatives is that they solve problems too. And the, the uncertainty and the lack of predictability that the paralysis in D.C. imposes on everyday people, on our businesses, and on our communities is really something that is difficult to deal with as a governor. You have to, um, because that's, that's the job. Uh, but there are so many areas in which there is a general agreement about what kind of direction we should go towards. And the fact that it is as stuck as it is, is really very, very frustrating uh, for our people. I heard a lot about it uh, through uh, sequestration. You know, the government shut down and then the sequestration bill, business is just so frustrated. Um, the transportation reauthorization funding right now, uh, you know, we know we need a modern and safe transportation infrastructure for businesses to get their goods to market, for commuters, for our tourism economy, for our public safety. Um, you know, we, the, the list goes on. Uh, last year we came together, a bipartisan transportation funding plan. We're investing in capital projects around the state. The fact that the feds can't seem to reauthorize um, the, the basic funding for transportation infrastructure has really got a lot of businesses concerned. And it makes it hard for them to plan, hard for them to invest, hard for them to hire. Uh, so um, I, you know, I encourage um, our delegation uh, to be as constructive as possible and move the ball forward. Um, and I think the American people are trying to say the same thing. Well, beginning already, the presidential candidates are going to be showing up in droves in our homes, yes. our restaurants, everything else. Then, after the primary, they will uh, after the primary they will systematically ignore us. But while we have them here, yeah. what ought we be asking folks from either side, either party, or if you want to direct different questions to different kinds of yeah. candidates? Um, I, I really think it's again twofold. It's what should our investment priorities be? Um, we know. We need to invest. We know we need to innovate, not just in encouraging an innovation economy, but in government we need to innovate. It's one of the things that I've really tried to focus on uh, in my first two years, but also in the budget I proposed. Uh, we, know, we know we need to stretch taxpayer dollars. All of those things being said, uh, we need to make sure we are investing in being prepared to lead in a global economy. And so I would ask candidates how they plan to do that. Um, I also think it's really important that we think a lot about what is being identified as the opportunity gap by authors like Bob Putnam, um, to really talk about what it is we can do to make sure that every American have that access to the things that, they, that will allow them to work hard for success. Um, and that includes healthcare, that includes transportation infrastructure and access, it inc includes education, um, it includes basic public safety. And uh, if we can make sure that we are investing in those things, identifying those things, giving everyday Americans access to those things so that they can work hard and have that, you know, have that opportunity for success, that's another question I would ask. There is great agreement about best practices, you know, if you talk to um, the governors in both political parties, we are all focused on workforce development, how to train up a 21st century workforce, recognizing a global economy, recognizing the need for ongoing education. Uh, we are all focused on transportation infrastructure, on healthcare, 
you know, just access to health care so that our businesses can have a healthy and productive workforce. There is great consensus um, in the business community about uh, support for things like Medicaid expansion, transportation, infrastructure, um, lowering energy costs in this part of the state, which requires a multifaceted approach, right? There is great consensus. So then the question is, how do you break the logjam, and are you willing to compromise, and how do you go about compromising? So as we go into that cycle, there's growing cynicism, particularly among millennials, by the way. There was this survey earlier this month that a high, shockingly high proportion of millennials would not consider running for office, that it's not something worth doing. A lot of this driven by money and politics. Mm -hmm. We've got the New Hampshire Rebellion going on. So yeah, yeah. can you talk a little bit about the influence of that and, if anything, what we can do to restore people's faith that the system reflects preferences and not organized interests? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. One is um, I hope people do consider going into politics running for elected office. I think New Hampshire is a great place to get exposure to that and to start doing that. Um, there are very few other pl places on earth that have, well, there's no place else on earth that has 424 elected representatives <laughs> for 1.3 million people. I think somebody worked it out the other day and said that's actually probably the uh, highest per capita representation of any place on earth. Um, uh, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds about right. Uh, it is, other than marrying my husband and having my children, um, serving in public office in New Hampshire has been the best thing I have ever done. Uh, whether it was in the state senate or as a governor, um, New Hampshire still does politics in a grassroots way where human capital and human interaction is extraordinarily important, and where the structure of a volunteer legislature uh, with 400 state reps um, and 24 senators means that people can run for office without having to raise huge sums of money, um, and that is really, really important. Um, I have long supported campaign finance reform uh, after Citizens United was started. I tried to uh, uh, get a bill passed that would have at least disclosure in New Hampshire. If a super PAC wanted to come in and fund anything in New Hampshire, they'd have to at least disclose who their uh, donors were. Um, we came close with that bill, but we didn't pass it. I think um, it, there, the rebellion movement that, as I understand it, would culminate in an amendment to the Constitution that would override Citizens United, I think is a very important step for our country. But in the meantime, I think it's also important that people understand that while candidates are in office, uh, they are going to um, navigate a campaign in the campaign financing rules that they have uh, so that they can compete. And I think it's really important that people stand up for disclosure, uh, transparency, and um, making sure that at the end of the day, uh, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of is I have donors uh, from every corner of the state. I have donors who give me my campaign five dollars, and I have donors who give maximum contributions, but there is a wide range of them. There is a wide portfolio, if you will, and what that does is really enable um, someone in office uh, to have a wide range of support, a, a wide range of donors, and a lot of people throughout the state who they are seeing and talking to on a regular basis. The best part about being New Hampshire's governor is I can go out and talk to people every day and it doesn't have to be planned and it doesn't have to be restricted. So, you know, if I walk into a Dunkin' Donuts, which I do with great frequency, and I, I don't think there's a Dunkin' Donuts in New Hampshire I haven't been to, but I'm not <laughs> sure, uh, because we're on the road a lot. Uh, you know, people will come up to me and talk to me and they'll tell me what's on their mind and I think that that's incredibly important and it's one of the best features of being an elected official in the Granite State. When I was in the State Senate, it was not uncommon for me to be doing my grocery shopping and, you know, people will stop you and they'll talk to you um, and that's still the case. And so trying to make sure that that accessibility is there is really important. Well, I think that's a good lead, and we're going to give you more of that opportunity now. There'll be no donuts or coffee, but we do have microphones, and so for the time remaining, we're going to ask uh, questions of the audience. I will, I'll call on you, but I would ask that you wait for the microphone because we're recording, even if the acoustics are good enough to hear. Um, so please open up questions. We'll go over here, if we can get a mic all the way across. Is it on? Yes. 
Governor Hassan, first off, uh, thank you very, very much for the role you played in the Senate and now as governor. Your, your work is impressive and we much appreciate it. Thank Second, you. My, my question, there, there are three particular proposals I'd like to hear your views on, one of which is the, the, the Northern Pass proposal for the electric transmission line through the state. The, the second one is the PSNH or Eversource uh, divestment settlement, but particularly with a stranded cost issue. And the third is the Kidder Morgan gas pipeline in the south. Are these, these fit in with your, your ideas of the vision for New Hampshire in the future? One of the things we need to address uh, as a state and as a region is the high cost of energy that is really impacting our national and global competitiveness, uh, but also addressing it in a way that protects our natural resources. Um, you know, my mom taught uh, history in my high school, and she always said, you can't understand history without understanding geography. And when you look at the geography of the Granite State, uh, we are a, a very rugged and individual people who also understand community, and that's in part because uh, when you, you look at the mountains, look at those individual peaks all connected at the base. When you think about our ruggedness, think about what it took to settle a state made of granite in icy cold temperatures, right? Uh, so um, those resources are not only important to our quality of life and important to our tourist and outdoor recreation economy, they're also just unbelievably important to who we are as a people, and we need to understand and protect that. Uh, that being said, we have this energy challenge, and we do need to find a way uh, to follow our 10-year energy strategy, which was developed uh, in the last year, first time in a while we've had one. Um, and that really identifies uh, four basic goals, um, better energy efficiency, uh, alternative energy, uh, a more reliable uh, and flexible grid for the state, but also finding a way to lower current prices, um, especially identifying the fact that uh, a resource like natural gas can be an important bridge fuel to that alternative renewable energy. Um, the Northern Pass proposal that was originally uh, proposed was not something I supported. Um, I have urged the company to go back to the drawing board to talk more with the people in the state and in the areas that would be impacted and find out if there are ways, for instance, to bury more of the line. I think hydro power is an important component of renewable energy, but I think we have to do that if we are going to do it in a way uh, that honors our natural places and our natural economy. I mean, you know, the, the recreational and tourist economy that is so much a part of uh, a lot of the places along the first route. Um, similarly, on the Kinder Morgan proposal, um, you know, you hear a lot of concern from folks who would, whose property would be impacted by a pipe through. Um, we certainly have natural gas pipelines in the Granite State. We certainly have them throughout the country. Um, the focus for me is uh, making sure that the company is communicating with the people whose property or communities would be impacted, listening to them before they take forward their final proposal, um, and making sure uh, that we are attending to uh, the safety issues that people have raised uh, with natural gas. Um, there, you know, there are safety issues with every kind of resource, um, and you know, if you travel to other parts of the state, concerns are raised about wind power, for example. So this is about how we talk with each other in the Granite State and how we find solutions that will both address our capacity need, because if we could increase natural gas capacity to this region of the country, it's incredibly important. But the last thing I'd say is, um, if we are going to bring uh, more transmission infrastructure into the Granite State, whether it's natural gas or hydro or wind, there have to be benefits for the Granite State, you know, and that's the other thing that I've really tried to make clear to all the proponents of this. I'm hearing from the business community a lot. They're concerned that we could get paralyzed and not get to solutions, but instead argue just about siting. Um, and I think there is a way forward, but it's going to take uh, true determination and commitment by all parties to find a solution that honors all these goals. Right here. Right here. Microphone. Way down in front. Sorry to make you. Thank you. 
So uh, relations uh, between police and citizens are now a major national issue. And here in New Hampshire, we had a controversy last year in which uh, the attorney general declined to prosecute a aware policeman who had uh, shot and killed a f an unarmed suspect who was fleeing in his car. Um, I read the report and it basically said that um, there was nothing to justify the shooting, but claimed that there wasn't enough evidence to prosecute. Uh, so I wonder, do you support your attorney, attorney general's decision not to prosecute? Uh, do you think this is an important issue here in New Hampshire? I, I think it is really important that um, we honor the traditions in New Hampshire of people in all areas of um, life, whether they are public safety officials, whether they are citizens, uh, to get to engage with each other, uh, understand each other, and interact with each other as full equals and citizens. Um, New Hampshire law enforcement generally is known for its professionalism and integrity. One of the things that we pride ourselves in is that every uh, law enforcement official in the Granite State goes through the same training so that there is more consistency than you might find in other places. Um, certainly, there are best practices that we need to be um, aspiring to, um, but I also think it is really important that neither, that it is important for law enforcement not to stereotype citizens. It is also really important for citizens not to stereotype law enforcement. And um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that there are interactions in which law enforcement has to make um, split-second decisions. And um, I, I think it's important for people to, just as we'd ask law enforcement to put themselves in the shoes of citizens um, who they need to police, I think citizens need to put themselves in the shoes of law enforcement too. Do you support this particular decision? I haven't reviewed it in a while, so before I, since it was some time ago, so I'd want to uh, go back and look carefully at the report before I opine on that. Uh, right there. Mm -hmm. Pass the mic. Green striped shirt. Um, so, sort of on that same vein uh, in criminal justice, uh, since I was born in 1994. The prison population in New Hampshire has increased by 1,000, mm -hmm. about 33% or so, and then 14 point, almost 15 percent since uh, you took office in 2013. So I was wondering, do you feel like you're doing enough to sort of transition inmates out in order to? I mean, if you're having budget problems, it costs 34 thousand dollars a year. So, what are you doing to sort of rehabilitate pr prisoners? Well, and, and so I'd be interested in the data in terms of your estimate of, of the increase uh, since 2013. Uh, but what I focus on uh, right now in particular is the fact that a number of people end up incarcerated, a large portion of our inmate population uh, ends up incarcerated because of um, crimes that relate to either mental illness or substance misuse. It's one of the reasons that I was such a strong advocate for the New Hampshire Health Protection Plan, which for the first time provides to the Medicaid population behavioral health and substance abuse treatment, which is really critical to the future, not only uh, of people who might otherwise uh, become involved with the criminal justice system because of behaviors related to those conditions, uh, but it's also really important uh, you know, for, for individual health and prosperity and for a productive workforce. Uh, I have also supported <coughs> policies that would um, identify people who are incarcerated, who are truly there for nonviolent offenses, and see if there are ways we can bring them out in close supervision for the last, for instance, 90 days of their sentence, uh, because we know that if people are closely supervised in the last 90 days of their sentence as they transition um, out of uh, state custody, that they have a much lower rate of recidivism. Um, but moving forward, I'm focused on making sure that we are really trying to address the mental health issues and the addiction issues that um, have become so much of um, the reason that people end up incarcerated. Uh, it is a lot more expensive to incarcerate somebody uh, by and large than to treat them. I actually have a follow-up, which is one of the scourges of both New Hampshire and Vermont is heroin and prescription drug abuse. So yeah. could you talk about the unique challenges of those drugs? Right, so, so one of the um, issues before us in the current budget 
is um, how we're going to go about continuing to address what is a really difficult issue in the Northeast. It is throughout the country, but we're seeing a particular spike in the Northeast. Um, in the middle of a substance abuse crisis, uh, which has been driven by a prescription drug addiction issue, as well as um, the increased uh, flow of heroin from uh, the South up here. Um, and, you know, so as we work to address those things, um, a couple of thoughts. We put into place a prescription monitoring program. New Hampshire was one of the last states to have that. So now we have data that allows a doctor or a pharmacist to see if somebody who is presenting to them with certain symptoms is likely to be drug seeking or are they likely to, or they really have the symptom. Um, we have a regional effort going to make sure over time that within New England we can actually share that data with each other. Doctors and pharmacists in Massachusetts or Vermont could share with New Hampshire because people go over the border so much. Um, Medicaid expansion, having um, substance abuse treatment dollars attached to it is incredibly important. Um, so are the efforts for prevention of the Governor's Commission on uh, Drug and Alcohol Prevention Treatment and Recovery. In my budget, I tripled funding for the Governor's Commission. Um, I also last year worked with the, Nash uh, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to establish a director of um, drug treatment and mental health services in this state attached to my office because we have a lot of nonprofit um, segmented efforts throughout New Hampshire and we need to make sure that we're doing this as carefully and well as possible and using the dollars as effectively as possible. Um, and then we work to pass Medicaid expansion. At stake right now in this budget is Medicaid expansion uh, because our Medicaid expansion sunsets in January of 17. Uh, right now, the Senate and the, the House didn't want to reauthorize it. The Senate says it won't take it up this year. That leaves at risk um, the treatment dollars that the federal government is paying 100% of now, will pay 95% of starting in 2017. Uh, meanwhile, the House uh, took away all the increase in funding uh, for the drug, uh, for the governor's commission, and the Senate just uh, took away the position that is really focused on coordinating efforts in the state. I think those are very misguided actions, and um, you know, one of the things that I, I always try to encourage people who are studying government uh, to look at is to look at budgets because that's where you connect the dots between what people say is important to them and what they're actually willing to do about it. And right now, uh, we are paying a lot of attention to uh, the opioid crisis, uh, but what we're going to do about it is in question. And it's really important that we have uh, folks in the state of New Hampshire, uh, we have treatment resources uh, for uh, people who either are challenged by addiction or who are challenged by mental health. And the most important thing we can do about that is to continue Medicaid expansion. Over on this side, so back. And, and this, is this the last one, Joanne? All right, you, the lucky microphone holder, the last question so we can honor thank you. the governor's Governor, schedule. thank you for being here. I believe I heard you mention innovation in government. Yeah. It seems to me that governments, well, it's obvious governments are by definition monopolies, which makes it very, very difficult for citizens to determine how effective they are. Could you just elaborate on that, what you're trying to do? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, what, one of the things, of course, that distinguishes the United States and our constitutional system is that uh, thanks to James Madison, the people decide how much power their government has as opposed to the other way around. And it takes ongoing citizen engagement to make sure the government works the way it should and addresses the priorities that people want them to. Um, we have worked really hard in New Hampshire to increase the transparency we have in the budgeting process. So for instance, uh, every state expenditure is now online. Uh, there's a transparent nh.gov uh, site. Um, and so we've begun taking some good steps also in uh, a couple of our agencies in particular like transportation with metrics we're trying to reach and um, then providing information about how we're doing. That being said, um, what we have been lacking in New Hampshire state government is somebody to take all the information and data that we now have, thanks to the digital age, and really integrate it in a meaningful way so that citizens could get a really good uh, snapshot of what's happening and whether certain programs or efforts are working. 
Uh, I proposed in my budget a chief operating officer for the state of New Hampshire, something that an awful lot of private businesses have and both Republican and Democratic governors across the country have. Uh, the New Hampshire House actually kept that in the budget. I think my mic just went out again. Okay. Do you want to fix it or do you want to? Um, yeah. If, I, I know we're taping it. Um, so the New Hampshire House actually kept that position in. The Senate just took it out. Uh, which disappoints me um, because I think it's a really important step forward for us. The other thing we've been trying to do is um, really address the history of uh, state agencies as silos uh, in New Hampshire. Um, I have a Department of Information Technology, but it right now doesn't have um, the ability to set information technology standards across state government. I have different email systems from different agencies, just to give you an example. Um, and so um, I proposed a number of efforts to try to standardize, give my IT department the capacity to standardize and innovate within IT. The Senate just removed that. Uh, so that's a challenge as well. Um, I think we will continue to have discussions about this and I'm hoping that both citizens and legislators of both parties can encourage legislators uh, to think about this uh, in a fresh way. Um, lastly, we do a lot of work um, kind of agency by agency uh, with lean processing, um, but again, it hasn't been a sustained effort. That's something that I'd like a chief operating officer to really be able to lead in because um, when you don't have people whose total focus is how are we innovating, how can we do this better, how can we integrate function, uh, you know, people have a lot of work to do and state, uh, number of state employees uh, has been reduced steadily since the recession hit. So you just have people with less and less time and that generally means that they attend to the urgent rather than the long-term important um, and it's not necessarily their fault and I'm, I, I'm amazed every day at how much some of our leaders in state government do in terms of lean processing and in terms of forward thinking, but it needs to be a much more sustained effort and we need um, to support efforts uh, throughout state government to do it. The, um, a, an initiative that has stayed in the budget so far is to consolidate all our healthcare licensing boards into one organization so that the boards have they, they keep their licensing authority, but their back office is integrated. So th those are some examples. Great. Well, I don't know if my microphone's probably gone too, but on behalf of the Rockefeller Center, I want to thank you for coming out, thank sharing you your thoughts, much. and we welcome you back anytime. Thank you. Thank you.